you might be one of the most productive human beings that I've ever met. And you say you just show up. When it comes to just showing up, what advice should you give someone who is maybe one of these people has a couple of calls a day, they've started on a business, they forget to train, they get caught up with stuff. How do you do it? And how would you encourage someone to be able to get more done? I stopped playing the victim card that so many people play. I haven't got time. I'm too, you're not fucking busy. Challenge anybody that's a coach that tells me they're busy. And you know what? That celebrity off of Love Island that said, we all have the same number of hours in a week, but it's what we do with that. Do you know what? She's not wrong. Stop playing the victim card. The reason you play in the victim card is because you're so comfortable in your life with your Netflix, your Uber Eats, your Deliveroo, and now the world of AI. The fucking world is becoming too easy. So Dean, I've been looking forward to this episode for a couple of reasons. One, I met you for the first time in person like only a month ago mm. and you saved me from, well, getting stuck down south when I didn't live there. And I tell you what, if we're going to talk about your, like, your military background, I have never seen such military evasion driving skills as you did to get to that uh, train station in about two minutes. Like, I, was, I remember holding onto my seat going, all right, mate, I won't go that quick. And I'm just sitting there like a girl in the back. Okay, I want to get the train. Um, so, Gene, for, first of all, before we go into it, welcome to the show. And Thank give you. a bit of an intro to who you are to people who are listening. Yep, perfect. Um, first of all, I'm sorry if I petrified you on the driving skills, mate. That was never the intention. But you had you a goal. You got me there. You got you me there. Goal. I don't care because the goal was to get me there and to keep me sane was a secondary target. Yeah, exactly. And to be fair, story of my life. Like, if you've got a goal, <laughs> if you've got a name, <laughs> I'll make sure you get you get you there and you achieve the target, mate. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, a little bit about me. Yeah, what a funny way to introduce ourselves, eh? Like the mad story we had when we first met. So um, first and foremost, I am a husband and a father. I'll always tell anybody that, you know, p what I do for my, my job role, my living, etc. that they're all great things, but they're not my purpose. My purpose is... Most importantly, my wife and my children, both of them, they all three, all three of those girls in my life are my everything. They always have been, not always have been, but have always been since they've been in this world. Um, so every time somebody asks me what I do, well, that, that, that's just like material stuff, isn't it? Like the most important thing for me is those two girls that you can just see above my head. For those of you that are watching this, um, they are my everything. So they are probably the reason why I do what I do. Um, aside from that and being a husband and a father, I'm also a coach, um, both online. Uh, I run an online business called the catalyst project, which helps and we'll, and I'm sure we'll dive into this in a little bit more detail, but we kind of go down the line of performance. We look with, and we go into things with a performance based narrative, um, whether that's an everyday athlete, whether it's a tactical athlete, but there is a very specific set of targets that we need to achieve and we have a very specific framework foundation and how we go through our business and then the other thing I do full time as a profession is I am essentially a strength and conditioning coach in the military um, looking after anywhere from four to five hundred um, tactical athletes and it sounds really 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 glamorous when you put it that way um, and you know what for, for want of for want of a better word it, it can be it's it's been an incredible job for me I've explored parts of the world that just wouldn't have been possible in Civvy Street. And I've been involved and in some of the most hostile situations in the world as well, which is comes with a, a level of resilience and fortitude and mental adaptability that kind of allow me to move the way I move and think the way I think and act the way I act. But the, the military has been a part of my life for nearly 16, 17 years now. Um, and yeah, I, I joined joined as a boy soldier or not a boy soldier. I joined after a little bit of time out in, in the civvy street, didn't fit in very well with people because my dad was military, came from a very big military family and ended up diving into being a soldier first, found my, found my love for strength and conditioning. Um, really, really back into back end of 2008, I would say I did a little bit of PT in before that, but it was like your classic body pump and kettlebell circuit on step. Oh, I remember them. Love those days. But yeah, so, you know, before then I started to dive into the world and wanted to become a military physical training instructor. So I did that and um, had some pretty good foundation knowledge, having done a crappy online course when they were 
they were the rave way, way, way back then. Um, I think I did mine with Discovery Learning, I think, way, but way back then. So yeah, just sort of like jumped into the field and it's been, yeah, it's been a great journey, but that's kind of a little bit about me, I suppose. It's not, I always like to start with, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dad and I'm a husband first, you know, that's, that's kind of who I am. Like people are, oh, who's Dean? Well, that's me. I'm, I'm, they're my everything. My profession is the surface layer stuff, but always the, always the deeper layer stuff is what matters the most. Right. I agree. And, and it's something that you, you, you don't think about it. Like I, I'd imagine if, you know, if the time comes where I'm a father, this will amplify, hmm. but it, it's something like you don't nothing. Like I got married three weeks ago. Nothing has changed. I've been with Ellie nine years. Nothing has changed. But the feeling of responsibility, the feeling of something to lose, the feeling of something to work hard for has changed a little bit. Mm. There's a little bit of more of a fire there. And I can imagine being a, like, like, how have you changed since becoming a parent? Oh, mate. Um, I was arguably the most in fact not much has changed to be quite honest with you i was an out there extroverted getting involved getting in amongst it stop out every single and even as a young even as a young lad drinking out with the lads in the town all the time like my fast cars i used to do that for a long time um but before i met rachel i was involved in a number of number of relationships none of one was really serious but between the ages of like 18 to 21 maybe a little bit longer than that actually maybe from 17 to 19 ish probably probably better way to look at it i was a rogue shitbag of an individual best way to describe it um very much in the wrong crowd to a degree um snapped my way out of it like like any other teenage boy like you go through those cycles in life don't you you know you try the drugs you try the alcohol you try this you try that you do silly things you get in fights you get involved with the old bill you get involved with and back then it was the german police when i lived in germany so they don't hold back like the, the german police will they won't just cuff you they'll pin your face on the floor and dig your knee in your schneb that type of character they were rough and tumble cowboys you know real into it but yeah so you know before before I got into marriage, before I met Rachel and started getting married life, I was just your classic, your classic stop out type of lad. Go out, get pissed. Didn't really like, yes, a little bit of narcissism and ego. Don't we all have that when we're, well, even now, like we all have it to a degree. Um, mine was just amplified even more because I wanted to be the center of attention all the time and kind of be the party goer, the, the people, the one that people went to for a good laugh. Let's go. Yeah. Go on. Dean will do that. Yeah. He'll do that. I'm like, yeah, come on then. Let's go. You know, whether it's getting shot in the ass with a potato gun or a potato cannon or jumping off of a four story building into a big paddling pool, like Dean would be the plonker that would do it. Um, so how that's changed now is I think my, both my wife and I have both evolved not just in like in life in general, but as human beings, as parents, you know, we started our relationship and we were very much down the line of, um, it was, it was courting early on in the, in our relationship, you know, trying what we could. Um, I, tr well, saying like that, I tried, failed miserably. Um, that just shows you the level of class that my wife was. She was like, nope. She was, she's like ultimate classy woman uh, and an incredibly elegant lady. Um, and which grounded me big time mm -hmm. because never have I ever been told no, let's put it that way. It was that type of, I was the type of shit bag that, and that's not egotistical or narcissistic. That's, I just, maybe my standards were that low. People just said, yeah, all right, then whatever. So it was, maybe that was the case, but where she was coming and she came into my life, um, my whole, my whole purpose changed entirely. Rachel and I got married um, after only being with each other for about a year we got engaged and married within a year of knowing each other. That's how quick we jumped into our relationship. And guess what? 16 years later to anybody that told us it wouldn't work to stick a middle finger up at because we're the best of friends. She is my soulmate. She's my everything. Um, and, you know, having best mates like that, anybody who's really involved in a good relationship knows what that feels like. Um, but I think that's only been made stronger because two weeks after we were married, I got shipped off to Iraq for uh, seven, seven odd months. Um, which tested our relationship massively hmm. as with anything, you know, not only did I get shipped off to Iraq 
and I was in obviously a relationship with Rachel. Um, my, I also went to Iraq with my dad. So my Rachel, my wife and my mum, they were very close. Like we lived in Germany, Rachel was studying abroad and that's where we met. And we kind of stayed in a student <laughs> flat together, which was pretty cool. Um, my dad and I got shipped out to Iraq um, together because he was serving in the same unit that I was in. And I became part of the easiest way to describe it is I became part of his close protection when them guys, when they were going out as the senior leadership to deliver education, training, mentorship, coaching to the Iraqi forces. That then came with a lot of stress and pressure in the family. So my youngest brother became the boy of the house, you know, for want of a better word. Um, he's six, seven years, my younger, but my mum and Rachel had to deal with the fact that not only did my mum had to deal with the fact, not only was her son away, but her husband was away. Rachel had to deal with the fact that not only was her husband away, her father-in-law was away. And as you can imagine in those years back in 2008, 2009, what you found was a lot of stuff was being thrown out on the media. A lot of stuff was thrown out on the media and it, it amplifies how people feel about that. Uh, people feel about what goes on in Iraq and what goes on in Afghanistan. The media is a really wishy-washy, polarizing viewpoint. Like, find me something that's all is positive in the news. You'll fail to do how, that. So, how does it differ? How do, how does did the experience being out there differ from what we were shown? So, you were probably shown. You would, put it this way, anything in the media needs it needs to be polarizing enough that grabs people's attention and gets people talking about it, whether it be on email, whether it be through Twitter, whatever those meet networks were back then, bloggers, the sun, the papers, it, it had to be as polarizing as possible. It was always about the British military have effed up again or they've done this again, when in actuality, that wasn't the case. When we were over in Iraq, being part of, we called it a MIT team. So mentoring, integration, teaching and training. We used to be part of a team that would go out and deliver to higher leadership, higher management in the Iraqi forces and help and support and mentor them, making strategic decisions, making operationally critical decisions, helping them with building a force, helping them building self-defense, helping them build out their military a little bit more. What that, what you guys saw on the media was British military of done this or they've done something wrong and they've done that and they've done this and then that it, that just wasn't the case like you when we were out there everything that we're doing kind of felt like we had a bit of a purpose and we were building some incredible relationship with these people like and you do like you have to in order to make an impact on somebody <clears throat> the language barrier was massive absolutely massive which is why you'll see military guys they are unbelievably good at communicating with anybody regardless of where they are regard regardless of language barriers body language hand gestures that sort of thing so we were with them day in day out teaching them how to be better at what they what they did in their job but the military the or the media portrayed <sighs> as things like you know we we're interfering we're we're rigging things we're causing riots and all this other and that that just wasn't the case. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the doom and gloom that so many people perceived it to be. And it used to be, it was like that. Mm -hmm. And it was classic. Like it's why you'll never hear me be a supporter of Piers Morgan ever because he single-handedly was one of the people that were trying to pull down nothing, no one from my cat badge, but pull down some people that were involved in some stuff that happened at what we used to call the bread basket. So the, the Iraq prisoner, like harm to prisoners of war, which again, weren't true. And all of the claims that he made were proven to be fabricated, were proven to be lies, were proven to be polarized to the rest of the UK public to put a negative agenda or a negative viewpoint on how the military were doing their job. And that just wasn't true, mate. Like it, it wasn't true. And the people that were involved in that, I wasn't involved in that per personally, but the people that were involved in that, their whole career, their whole life, everything about them was absolutely ripped from underneath them because of somebody like that, that tarnished the media or tarnished him with, or them with that brush and the media believe it, you know, and people get ostracized by it. So since that day, 
I, I can tell you right now, I have not watched the news in 15 years, at least. Maybe even more. Have I've you ever experienced watched. it the other way around? When, because like, it, uh, the Iraq war was a very unique thing because there was so much confusion and animosity about the reasons why we went to war. Mm -hmm. And maybe not legitimate. So I can see where this, this in a way, this backlash of the, the military, undeservedly so, because it wasn't, you didn't send yourself there, came from. But at the same time, I can imagine there are so many conflicts which are potentially like that if it never came out, where you're sent somewhere based off queen and country, and you're feel that you are the good guys, and the militaries are portraying, we are the good guys, these are the villains. Like we can look at it right now. If you look at the military, Ukraine are the heroes. Russia are the enemy. Yeah. Where I can imagine if you went out on the front line, like like no one's e evil and good. It, it, people's are shades of grey. Like, have you ever been sent anywhere where you've gone, like, actually, we're not entirely the good guys here? Or have, it, have you always had this big, strong moral compass with the guys around you? And if not, how did you deal with that? So, the job done. my moral compass and my my ethics have been tested. Of course they have. Anybody who served in Afghanistan, who served in, who served in Iraq, we're not like, you're in, you're in the midst and the thick of shit. You're not going to make the best decisions. But it's why you're trained so in depth and detail down to the decision-making points where they can make and break you. You're trained in that way to try and make a good decision. Most importantly, as a human, you just try and make the morally right decision. What happens at the highest level of leadership and why we go out to those countries has nothing to do, nothing to do with, I'd say, about 99.9% .9 of the boys and girls that join the military. Most people don't join the military because of a pol political agenda. Most people join the military because they don't have anywhere else to go. Didn't really succeed in the early day, early stages of their career. Some people might be patriotic, might do it for queen and country. I didn't do it for queen and country. I honestly, I'm not really that asked about the queen and country shit. If I'm brutally honest with you, it has no, you know, maybe that's, but I'm, I'm patriotic. I, of course I, I love, I love England. I love being British. I loved, I love the, <clears throat> the character traits. I love what we stand for. I love all of that, of course, but it's not why I joined the military. I joined the military because I'd fuck all else to do. So us going out to Iraq, to Afghanistan, of course you're tested morally, ethically. And have you made the wrong decision? I've made wrong decisions. Of course, I've made wrong decisions. Who's not made bloody wrong decisions? Said something wrong or done something <laughs> stupid that they perhaps shouldn't have done. But to go back to your point about we're not always, we, you know, are we portrayed, we might be portrayed as the good guys, but actually what goes on behind the scenes, nobody's out there inadvertently trying to be a bad person. Hmm. Nobody. You know, you go out there. The first thing that you do is, is my mucker left and right of me? Are they safe? Am I safe? Are we safe? Are we protected? You're always going to protect your best interests and the people that are left and right of you. Always. I grew up with half of the people I went on tour to Iraq with. You know, I, and again, the guys I went out to Afghanistan with, these are family friends. They're, they're all, we're all part of a brotherhood. And that's what it was. You know, we're all really, really close. And it's like, you're literally shitting eating sleeping living talking laughing crying with these people every single day week in week out so if anything happens to one of them there's going to be a you're going to become the aggressor you're going to want to do things to people that you know as you would as you would without you know without going into too much detail as you would but the bottom line is mate when you go out there in somewhere like afghanistan people people are people want to kill you and equally, you've got a job to do, and you. Some people join to go and do that. Hmm. You know, it's not. It's not, like, fucking, it's not an are, easy place to be. There, there are, as you said, there are people that go out and do that. But I, 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 I would assume that that is not the majority of the military. No, like one. I was in the majority of people there with a bloodthirst, and we said that obviously there are there are you go out there and sometimes you do realize that like, no, as you said, you are self-aware enough to realize no one's out there to harm on both sides of the coin: Afghanis, Iraqis, British. Americans That's not ever. technically true because you go out there, you've been stood in the face of anybody in any sort of terrorist organization, ISIS, ISIL, anybody that when they, they want to hurt you and they'll do it in the dirtiest way that they can possible. 
like we we are we are not welcome over there most of the time we're not welcome mm -hmm. in those areas at all at all in any way shape or form however if if we were out there in a different sphere go back to the go back to the 1890s the 1900s early doors mate afghanistan and iraq were thriving destinations thriving tourist populations so you can't get into the history of all the war we just we just no time for that but they've seen their country completely disintegrate <clears throat> to become yet a third world country that's been ostracized from the whole of the world to be absolute shit i tell you what you don't see i guarantee you've never seen how incredibly beautiful northern iraq is and the mountainous region Go imagine. online and type in Northern Iraq, anybody watching this, and you will, you will never see Northern Iraq. You will never, ever, ever see the pictures that what Iraq is about because you've been pictured places like Basra, places like Baghdad, places like the stuff that happened with Saddam Hussein, the palace stuff that happened with the petrol bombs, the riots, the war, the improvised explode. You've seen all of that stuff. You've seen all of the shithole of what happens in Iraq. <clears throat> Guess what? We've got that in the UK as well. But the, you go and have a look at what happens in the northern Iraq, mate, it's a stunning part of the world. So I want to caveat that by saying, like, yes, people don't go out there to do arm, but like people join the military to go and do that. Like a lot of people like to do that, mm. as bad as it sounds. But equally, when we go out there, be under no illusion. Like they want to, it's the same with the UK, <laughs> Ukraine and Russian war. Like the, nobody wants to die, but... <laughs> When the Ukrainians hate the Russians and the Russians hate the Ukrainians, they want to kill each other. Is there, is there, is there a closer hand. confidence, though, sometimes between maybe not in these terrorist organizations who maybe are out there looking to generally looking to hurt you? But I can imagine going out there and let's if you put yourself now in the in the front line of Ukraine, the people that you're going to deal with and do battle with and fire at are probably frontline soldiers who are doing a job. And maybe, yes, they're patriotic to Russia, but they're not looking to initially, if it wasn't for this war, not looking to kill you. Yeah. There, there must be a very hard mental battle here. It's like, you have to be ruthless to someone who is essentially you. There's no animosity to them. And, and, and without being that super patriotic, these guys are the enemy. Like, how do you muster the courage to, to do the, the, the job you have to do, which is beyond comprehension for most of the people listening to this you know is it because you've built such a bond with the people around you that these guys and keeping these guys safe and myself safe to help these guys comes before what the people on the other side doing the same thing are yeah but probably a difficult one to answer i think you're, you're indoctrinated and institutionalized in the military to mm -hmm. first and foremost you look after your troop, you look after your platoon, you look after your section and the people that are within it. So you'll do anything to protect those people. Equally, that then goes down to regimental and battalion level. You'll do anything in your battalion, anything in your regiment to protect those people. Into rivalry with regiments and battalions is a thing. Into rivalry with cause is also a thing. Even at like core level sport, you go and play the engineers and the infantry play football. They're going out with the same objective to win and they'll do whatever they can to freaking win. It's the same thing. However, in an operational environment, anybody that's wearing NATO, anybody that's in the British military, in the British army, the British air force, the British Navy, whatever, it doesn't matter who they are. You're there to, you're there to go out and do your job and you'll do anything that you can to protect. And I'll tell you one thing, when, when there's a vigil that takes place out there, it, it fucking hits home. Like it really hits home when you hear that somebody is somebody's life's been taken, something's happened. There's a ceremony, you know, there's, there's a little bit of you, you guys won't hear about it straight away. The media won't hear about it. It'll come out a couple of days later, but people that are out there that they, people are suffering, man, because they've had people in there. I've had people close in my life that have been taken from us by something which inevitably didn't need to happen because of the higher leadership that okay. want to go out and do their political fucking bullshit. I'm not interested in any of that crap. And sometimes now it hurts to hear people say that we went out there and for, for nothing. Well, that hurts because there's people out there that went out to do a job and thought they were doing the best thing by them. They've lost their fucking life. Who are you to say that we went out there and did nothing? Have you been there? Have you done that job out there? Then if you haven't shut up, don't talk about it. You've got no right to talk. You can have an opinion, 
but don't voice it in a way that degrades the people that have lost their life. Yeah. So to go back to that point of, you know, it, how do you build up the moral compass? You, I don't know, mate. I just think that being in the military you, you, or being in the army, you just, it's a job. You're trained to do that type of stuff. And when you go over on the, over, over overseas, do you have these twitchy bum moments? Yes, you do. A lot of the time. Do you know what is right from wrong? Yeah, you try and do the right thing as a somebody as a human to do the right thing and the wrong thing at the wrong time or the right time. But how do you know, how do you have the courage and the moral fiber to be able to stand up? Honestly, I don't know. Maybe it's because mm -hmm. you've got two or three or four or five or six of your closest friends in the military that are doing exactly the same with you and you'd hate like people just don't think about it, mate. People don't think about it. If I implore mm. you to talk to anybody, I could probably put two or three people in your books that you could speak to who would might be able to answer that better because they've properly, properly suffered. I'm in no position to I don't think that's true. i I'm I am very fortunate. Very fucking lucky. Very lucky to have been in the position I was in. Very lucky to have what has happened to me happen other people aren't so lucky mm -hmm. um but maybe they'll tell you otherwise maybe they'll tell you they are lucky one of our of an absolute legend of a human being matthew whiskin lost his leg out in iraq uh, sorry out in afghanistan in 2012 he'll probably he'll probably tell you he's lucky he's one of the lucky ones and he will tell you why he does it everybody has their own reason <laughs> most people yeah. reason is to fucking come home to their why and my why is behind my head I just wanted to come home and be safe with my kids. I wanted to come home and yeah. be safe with my wife. So you do whatever you need to do. You, know, you you do whatever job you can. You do whatever role you can. You protect the other people next to you. But I'm like, nobody wants to fucking die. Nobody yeah. goes out there actively wanting to die. Unfortunately, in some of those countries, people are completely brainwashed and polarized in the other direction. Yeah. And you know that that they're them they're dangerous people, mate. They are really dangerous people, and they're smart. People think those guys out there that are, that we're fighting against they're stupid. They're not. I'm telling you right now, they are the smartest, most adaptable, dynamic, diverse communities of people that you can come up against. And they are they are not stupid. And it's disrespectful to say to people like these guys are stupid. They're fucking. Yeah. What are they doing? Why are they? They're not. You just, you, they've, their whole world has been ripped apart. Everything like any, even to a point where you hear about their religion and people squalor at it. Like, who are you to squalor at it? Like whatever, you know, th these people have had their country ripped to shreds, thrown apart. And maybe that's taken me the time that it's taken me to reflect on it and talk yeah. about it in the way that I can and think about it in the way that I can be under no illusion. When you hear one of the boys has had an injury or something's happened to somebody, that's not what you're thinking about. Mm. You're thinking the polar opposite. You're thinking you want to go out there and rip people's faces off. So like some people go out with a bit of a vengeance. I have no doubt that people have done that. In, in, in the same way that people there probably have a bit of a vengeance for the world being torn apart, right? And it's... <laughs> exactly. And that stems back... In, can, in put it to you this way. Imagine, imagine in the UK, imagine in the Western society that we lived in, that hundreds and thousands of foreign fighters foreign nationals foreign troops came into our country started ordering us around moving us in files telling us to do this blowing up our buildings blowing up our roads killing people that are in that cult imagine imagine that happened here if the shoe was on the other foot how would you respond to that hmm. these guys and girls these ladies these boys these kids They've been part of a worn, torn country and they know no different. That's all they know. That's all they've ever been told about. Their grandparents have told them of what a life it used to be like. So they automatically are bred into hate. <clears throat> They're bred into like, who the hell are these foreign? Like, imagine that. Imagine mm. that happening in the UK. Imagine we were on a hotbed of oil. We're on a hotbed of fuel. We're on a hotbed of resources. We're on a, you know, imagine that. And that's that's what the sense that came back to my original question, but I find find so find so interesting because it's like I always think back to that um, that moment in I can't even remember World War One or World War Two where the the German and the British troops played football on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. 
Mm. And I, I always think about, like, while that's a lovely, nice little story to talk about Christmas, I always think, well, what was Boxing Day like? When those people who you may be bonded with a little bit, even in for a short period of time, you now have to shoot at them and yeah. kill them. Yeah. And while we're not going to have these football games, I don't think, uh, anymore, it's the same thing when you go out there and you understand and you look at that child in the street and you look at that man shooting at you and you go, he's 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 justified. Yeah. We're right, rightly or wrongly, not saying that we are not either, right. but it's that that difficult thing to be able to then switch it on is is, is an interesting thing. I think going into that concept of luck is why I think it's interesting because you're saying like, well, luck's a really interesting term because it's not only is it irrelevant, that guy that lost his leg is probably thinking, I'm lucky it wasn't my head. Yep. And luck is also, in hindsight, like how many times, when you see anyone that's majorly successful, they are more often driven by pain more than they are driven by pleasure. Like you came on here and said, it's your wife and kids that drive you. 100%. And while I'm sure there are other things that drive you that are a bit more pain related, I think you're in a rare scenario that your success is driven by a pleasurable thing. And I go, would I want to look back and want not to be bullied? Would I look back and want all the bad things in my life not to happen? Because I would consider myself lucky to have those experiences. Because yeah. where would I be if I hadn't? So like looking back at your time in the military, how do you think that's developed you as a person? Every single, interestingly, the greatest things that have happened to me have come from the worst moments in my life. Mm -hmm. The greatest things that have come to fruition, whether it's, you know, and it, again, it's, it's hard to put into perspective. The reason I'm in a relationship with my wife is because of the worst and lowest points that I was at in my relationships and life before. The greatest points and the greatest conversations I've ever had with my mum. God bless her soul, she's no longer with us, but the greatest things and the greatest revelations that ever took place between me and my mum were because of the worst experiences that ever happened in my life as a young boy. The same can be applied in the military. The greatest relationships, bonds, friendships, love that I have with people I've served with in the military have all come from when we were in the shittest place in the world we were in the dirtiest, darkest, worst position possible. And every single one of those experiences has <clears> lent <throat> itself to a great moment or a great event or a, a homecoming or an incredible moment in life that you just look at and you go, fuck me. Wow. That that's really, really. And I think you need to have those shit moments in order to have the good moments. You can't have a great life without having really bad times. Like if you think that's going to happen, <laughs> mm. And it's the I same think, we apply to business as well. So it's yeah, interesting. I, th I think it's, I think I always really, really like talking to people that have been in the military because like you mentioned earlier on that a lot of people join the military based on the fact they maybe were down and out. They maybe failed at stuff. And it, it, not that it's the only option. I, I know for you, this probably was quite an appealing option with your family being part of yeah. this, but we got people, it, it almost is a crossroads. If a lot of people join the military because they weren't good and failed in certain avenues of life and they join the military as that escape and that route to kind of make something themselves. Everyone I've met that comes out of the military, very well adjusted, very smart, mm -hmm. often makes very successful businesses. If you see that same person that decided not to go into the military, that's a very different picture most of the time. And like, I'm always fascinated by that because it, it, it really, it, it does something right for all the things that are really hard. And maybe it's the hardness that is the thing. There is a value to going through that process. Yeah. But I've always admired it. And for, for when I was young, I always had this thing of like, I'd love to do that. However, I am not ashamed to admit that I am way too much of a coward to ever say, I couldn't go into a ministry thing, even if going in as a PTI, which the chances of going out are less, I, I imagine, but you still did as that person. So I could not wholeheartedly go in there and go, I could do that because I couldn't. I, I am a wholeheartedly not brave enough. And I don't think I'm alone in that. So like you now having gone through that process and almost training other people to sort of kind of get a bit of that without actually doing that, how can the regular person install some of the character traits that the military give them without having to put a gun in their arm and go off to Afghanistan? You're going to ask me for fucking dropping David Goggins quotes in here now, aren't you? So <laughs> first things first, um, 
I want Dean Hammond quotes. Ah, uh, you ain't getting it, that. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I, I think, interestingly, you look at people like, there's people out there doing it now. Um, you look at your Jocko Wilnick, you look at your David Goggins um, of the world. They're, they're trying to explain to people what mental toughness looks like, what hardship looks like, what resilience looks like. Even down to the lowest level nowadays, you're getting people talking about cold showers and cold water immersion therapy. And Can you fake that? It's not the same. No cold it's, shower's going to give not. me the hardship that a tour in Afghanistan will give me. It, it, you're never going to get that. You're not going to get that. Because and I, this, is where, this is where military men and women are the most unique people in the whole of this fucking country. They have a set of skills like no other. And they have a set of experiences like no other that a lot of men and women in the UK just cannot fathom and will never understand, which is why when you find somebody who is incredible at what they do from the military and they can teach resilience and hardship and mental tenacity and mental fortitude and they can do it through exercise and fitness and health or well-being or whatever they do these resilient weekends you look at it now the billy billinghams the the ant middletons all of those type of characters they are fight they're using their experiences in times of difficulty in times of need in times of challenge in times of adversity and putting people through their paces in that way you're never going to be what those boys and girls have been you're never going to experience what those boys and girls have experienced but what they can do is they can give you a little bit of a taste of it and you can get a bit of taste of what it's like being screamed at in your face at three o'clock in the morning to get out of your dos bag your sleeping bag put on your cold wet kit like they all glamorize and and glorify all online the bottom line is you are never going to experience what those boys and girls have experienced that have come out of the military. So in answer to your question, how do you replicate mirror? You can't, you can't replicate mirror and do those things because those things don't exist in normal life. The only way you can do it is by pushing people beyond and out of their comfort zones, pushing people well and above and beyond of what they think that they are capable of. And they use that phrase in you know, inch by inch, step by step, yard by yard, pace by pace, you just layer resilience in the same type of way. You try and you try and take like you try and take an athlete into the realm of pushing what real strength endurance looks like. You try and take an athlete to push into the realm of what real failure looks like because every rep that you fail is another kink that's added to the resilience chain. It's another link that's added to the mental tenacity and mental fortitude chain. You just keep trying to do that, like layer by layer by layer. It's the same in the military. People don't join the military and are, bang, in, instantaneously brave and courageous because there are also people in the military that are absolute cowards. There are also people in the military that morally and ethically compasses a rule off. There are people in the military that <clears throat> are selfish. There are people in the military that are, not committed to the boys left and right of them. There are a lot of people in the military that shouldn't be in the military because of their physical stamina, their physical fitness, their mental wiring, their mental capacity, because they don't have. And there are a lot of people that will not deploy in the military because they don't have those attributes. Equally, there are a lot of people in the military that had those attributes, got injured, got hurt, suffered with PTSD, suffered with mental issues, mental health problems that, again, have earned their stripes, earned the right to be who they are, but it's come at the cost of more than their health and their wellness. And one thing I want to sort of bring out to you is <clears throat> you're not a coward, mate. You're not a coward. And it's not about you not wanting to do it because you think you're a coward and you're not brave. It's because you just don't know. It's the unknown. And the thing is that people think you're going to go into this hardcore boot camp style room with 50,000 beds. You're going to be spat at, kicked at, broken, built up again. Like that, that's not the type of military now. It's evolving year by year. Like it's not that. It's a, the military has painted, been painted a picture of 
being great like you you know it's it is difficult it can be difficult but the barrier to entry has changed getting to go on operational deployment and operational tour has changed you know we're not running wars of like the Falklands war. We're not doing up grand B, which was the Iraq campaign years and years and years ago, which, what, which even my old boy was part of, you know, my dad was part of that invasion where all the Brits went over to the Q80 line into Iraq and they fought off hardcore war. That was hardcore war back then. Same as Afghanistan. People are not going to experience weighing through an absolute cesspit of shit up to their knee deep hip deep full of crap in these irrigation ditches getting shot at blown up trying to follow a tracker that's on a phone that's telling somebody over there to fire that way because that's what no you, you, people are not going to experience that anymore certainly not in the immediate in the in, in interim period like afghanistan is not the type of war that we're in at the moment guess what Iraq, look at that place. That was a war. Now we've got British troops in the middle of Iraq teaching. And I was out there two or three years ago and I wanted to show you this because I think you were talking about football. And I, I don't know how well we're going to see this on the camera, but that is a picture of me banging the center with hunt, like a good 40, 50 people that you go back 20 years ago would have wanted to put a bullet in my head. And I'm playing football with them on a seven aside and we're laughing and joking. We're breaking bread. <clears throat> we're having an incredible time. You know, we're, we're just bonding like absolutely nothing else. And you will never, ever, ever, ever see that because again, media want to portray me as being all it's good. Like it's not that type of place anymore. So hmm. you are not a coward and you are not, not brave. It's just, you don't know. It's the unknown. And I guarantee if you had nothing left, if you had no business, if the world fell apart, if your world fell apart, want a better word and you touch wood, it never does. If military was the last place for you, you probably sign the dotted line and, and join the military. Mm -hmm. And anybody, and like, I don't say that this lightly, like anybody can do it. You, you can do it. You can, you can be trained to do it. It's not, it's not as difficult and as doom and gloom as people think it is. And equally, military comes with some amazing experiences, amazing experiences, experiences in sport. I've, I've, been in a kayak for two weeks kayaking down the Kananaskis river in Canada, right through the Rocky mountains and didn't pay a penny. I've climbed up. I've climbed up Mount Yamnuska in the Rocky mountains. I've been to Italy. I've been to Canada on sports tours. I've been to, I've been all over Europe, traveled the world doing sporting experiences that just are out of this world and haven't had to pay anything for. Mm. So, you know, there's lots of great things. You go back to the point about, you know, how do civvies get to experience civilians? How do they have experience a little bit of what the military can offer them? Mate, I'm the wrong person to tell you that because I'm not the type of person that glorifies dunking yourself in a fucking river, doing your ice baths and getting <clears throat> cold and wet and being shouted at and spat at. And like you sit the, Leave that to the the leave that to the military celebrities that are doing that at a minute because mm. it mate first of all, I don't know why why it's so attractive I genuinely don't know why people find that type of shit attractive that S A S he who dares wins type of shit or who dares wins type of stuff like I don't know why people people must just love what that brings with them they want to find their purpose they want to find yeah. that I, 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 think, I think you've hit the nail on the head with purpose I think there's an element of the world's got so comfortable. If you want to watch a film, we've got Netflix. If you want to have food, we get delivery. Um, the, we, we are in this world now where it's just so comfortable that people who they don't have a clear purpose, how do they get out of their own way? And essentially, I think with this, I can imagine what, what, what the little taster of what the military can offer, what these things do is help people get out of their own way and make yeah. them realize they are so much more capable than they thought they were. Now, when you look at this in terms of comfort, for me, that could be, I'm saying yes to flying out to Budapest on my best friend's wedding yeah. and then I'm following up with going to Amsterdam for a seminar. I have put money down on a membership site for my clients. I have jumped into going self-employed. Yeah. These are all things that, that get you out of your way that aren't necessarily... People think hardship has to come with horrendous 
things. It's, oh, I have to be cold. I have to be wet. I have to um, do something uncomfortable. But imagine 10 years ago, if you'd gone on Dragon's Den and gone, tried to advertise, I'm, I'm going to tell people to breathe and get in an ice tub or float tanks. I'm going to make a big bubble bath. And I'm charging people 100 quid for the privilege of sitting in there for 90 minutes. You'd say I'm out, but people are looking for uncomfortable situations because life has got too comfortable. And all they really need is a purpose to actually get out of their own way. Like, I would would you agree with that? No, I would disagree. I would agree. I, I, you ha- to a degree, yeah, but people are too comfortable now. People are too happy with their Uber Eats and their Netflixes and waking up at nine as a coach and going to the gym and training and coming back and doing a couple of little check-ins and, you know, the, the, the only <laughs> resilience they have is when it fucking rains and they walk to the gym and, oh my God, they've got to put a waterproof coat on. That's their level of resilience. Like I'm, But, that, that, but that's, on... essentially, that's essentially my point, right? Because the world is like that. Yeah, yeah, they, don't have any, that. they don't have any discomfort in their life. So now they find it through an ice bath. But how many people are actually chasing discomfort? Really? Let's be honest. Mm. How many people are actually chasing discomfort? Because what you see with somebody stepping into a fucking loomy pod that is apparently ice cold, but it's like zero degree. That's not, that's not resilient. Well, ex- exactly. It's, 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 it's like going it's on resilient. a course so you can post it on Instagram tagging the mentor rather than actually taking your notebook out and learning from the course. It's perceived struggle. Yeah rather than true struggle. It's I want the world to think I'm actually grafting, that I'm actually grafting. Yeah. The people that are the most resilient, the hardest workers, the ones that have been through the thick of shit, they're the ones that work hard in silence and let the results speak in public. Hmm. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. Like that, that is the bottom line. And unfortunately, you're <laughs> in a world where the glamorization of, I, do you know what? In my small social media corner of the world, I try really, really fucking hard to not be that douchebag. I try really, really hard to just show up every day. Just give a little bit of something to somebody out there that might just be struggling with whatever it is. Because there are so many pick me up fucking shit fluences that will give you the guide and give the answer and tell you to buy a Lumi and dunk yourself in an ice bath and go and run 30 K every day and push the resilience and go to the gym. Like people are, and it's, and, and I want to, I want to be that small person in the social media world, that little corner of the world where I can bring a little bit of positivity, but meet somebody where they are. Look, if you ain't got an ice bath, Stop fucking telling people to get in an ice bath. Stop telling people to use your whoop strap discount code and buy a fucking whoop so they can monitor their heart rate variability and their stress index and their blood oxygen levels and their respiratory rate. Stop telling people to do that. Meet somebody where they are halfway. Say, look, if you want to try and just challenge yourself a little bit every morning or every night, Every night before you go to bed, just that challenge for you is not put your phone on the bedside table. Just don't have your phone on the bedside. You know what? The challenge to you is turn your fucking phone off an hour before you go to bed. Spend some quality time with your wife or your kids. Like if that's going to challenge every bias for you, then do that. You don't have to become this all encompassing polarizing individual that now takes off their shoes and crocs every morning and go and grounds their self in molten lava outside their garden whilst praying to the, you don't have to do that's not resilience. That's not like if that works for you, good, perfect. That works for you. But the thing that the, the interesting thing that you asked me is like, how do people build re- You've asked me that question because You've seen people like Billy Billingham and Ant Middleton and all these other glorious, glorified military mentors that will help you build the resilience of a military. You don't need the military as a like the military train you in a way to go and deliver and deal with shit out in lots of different parts of the world. When we're maladaptable, we're incredibly diverse, we're so dynamic. You don't need the military to teach you to do that. You can do that in other ways. And if that's just you turning on that cold bit of the shower for 30 seconds because that's all you've got good don't let some shit fit fluencer tell you you need to go and buy a loomy pod because that's going to help you build resilience because it's not mate 
as you, we mentioned the term bravery earlier on, right? And bravery, I, I've, I always define it as like acting in spite of fear rather than not having any fear. Mm. And so when you look at some of these things, you mentioned earlier on, you could do what you did in the military because of purpose. You had a greater desire, whether it's for the people to your left and right, whether it's for your wife and kids back home, whether it's for the job you were trained to do. Yeah. So these difficult stuff, this lying around the mud or go pushing past your physical limitations or whatever it was, was important because it got me closer to why. Whereas now we see or people... Or was it act- important because at the end of it, I knew I was going to get a cup of tea and I didn't have to endure this shit anymore? Yeah, exactly. And then when you, but when you look at people now, they're doing these things. Like, I'm not saying to anyone that an ice bath or a cold shower or Wim Hof breathing can't be good things. But at the end of the day, these things are only useful if it gets you out of your own way and gives you the kickstart to get started on the thing that actually matters. No one gets to the end of their life and looks back and goes, have I achieved everything? Yeah, I had an ice bath every morning. If the ice bath gets you up and awake so you can actually take action on your business, your life, your family, then it's great. But the ice bath alone is pointless. Yeah. So you could just, and this is why, I mean, Alex and Mosey talks about ice baths and morning <laughs> routines. Like, I just get up and do work. Yeah. So if you could do it without it, you don't need it. Yeah. And I suppose my next question for you is like, the people listening to this, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people are going to be coaches. And mm-hmm. you run... You're still in the military full yep. time. Yep. You run a successful online coaching business. Yep. You're a father. Mm-hmm. You're a husband. You run mentorships for supercharged. Yep. So when we talk about getting stuff done and acting in spite of fear, you might be one of the most productive human beings that I've ever met. And or you say you just show you up. Believe. Maybe. Maybe. And that's what we, that's what I'm gonna come into. But like when it comes to just showing up, like how how do what advice should you give someone who is Maybe one of these people has a couple of calls a day. They start on a business. They forget to train. They get caught up with stuff. Like, how would you get someone? How do you do it? And how would you encourage someone to be able to get more done? I stopped playing the victim card. I stopped playing the victim card that so many people play. I haven't got time. I'm too. You're not fucking busy. Challenge anybody that's a coach that tells me they're busy. And you know what? That celebrity off of, and it just, it came into my mind then, that, that celebrity that came off of Love Island that said, we all have the same number of hours in a week, but it's what we do with that. I can't remember her name, the blonde girl, but yeah, yeah. it's what you do with it. Lucy or something, maybe, I can't remember. But do you know what? She's not wrong. Just because she is a celebrity and she had some, a little bit of money behind her, it was easy for her, easy for her. So fucking what? Stop playing the victim card. The reason you play in the victim card is because you're so comfortable in your life with your Netflix, your Uber Eats, your Deliveroo, and now the world of AI where you ask AI to, I don't know, write you a diet plan or you ask AI to help you frame a full body workout. Like like the fucking world is becoming too easy. And that's why I said when we had that conversation the other day, right? Like I want coaches to graft hard and know what it's like to stay up till 12, one o'clock at night to work through a program that is specifically driven towards somebody's compositional goal. I don't, I don't want you to use it. I'm not saying don't use frameworks, but you have to earn the right to do that. You got to do the hard yards. And this is the thing I'm going to say to you is people think I've got all of my shit together. Do you know what? I've got very good at compartmentalizing everything that goes on in my life. I fill every single cup that I can fill my wife's cup, fill my kid's cup, fill my own me cup. And am I, do I get burnt out? Of course I get fucking burnt out. Be lying to you if I was telling you anything otherwise, but guess what? Nobody on Instagram tells you that because it's not sexy and it's not fucking real and it doesn't sell. And guess what? That's why I come on and tell people Fuck, I'm, I'm hanging out. I'm, I'm tired. You'll always see me be real online. You'll always see me, as be me being me. So I have got all of my shit together, but guess what? Some days it also looks like a bomb's gone off. There is 168 hours in a week. We sleep for 56 of those. What are we doing with the other 104? Well, in that other 104, I've got to now go and give 40 hours and 45 hours of that to the military. I've now got 50, 60 hours left. I've got to eat, sleep, shit, coach, train. I have to do something. So life isn't balanced. There's no such thing as balance. 
if you were if it, you, anybody watched my story the other day i was up until half past 12 on a weeknight building into flow state because of programming because guess what you can talk about a power down hour all you want you can talk about um not having screen after screen time after <clears throat> 9 10 11 p.m that doesn't work for me mate you can talk about waking up at you can talk about getting your perfect seven, eight hours sleep, taking your nighttime nootropics, your ashwagandha, making sure you wake up in the morning, do your pint of water, go and do your grounding. Guess what? That ain't working for me. What works for me is getting up, nailing a coffee and getting after the day and doing whatever I need to do. And if that means waking up at 4.35 just to try and get a couple of check-ins done so it frees up an, an hour of my time with my wife and kids in the evening so I can play stupid games like dollies or go outside and be an absolute prat with them because they do, we've got these big blow up tumble mats and they want me to stand there and try and do it with them. I'm going to go and do that. And I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice sleep to go and do that. Like it's always about sacrifice. Balance doesn't exist. And I think people believe that there's a perfect balance of this. I think people believe that we go through, a, we go through something we call it the work week, right? The supercharged work week. And we, people try and balance things out. The reason people are lost or people don't know, maybe people are lost or people, people aren't where they are. is because they haven't done the work. They haven't done the work, Simon. That's it. Like it's nobody else's fault. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's not Ollie's fault. It's not, it's nobody's fault. Like clients come to me and if they don't get the result, it, it actually, it is my fault if they don't get the result, but it's also their fault. Like, why didn't you get the result? Because you didn't set that alarm and wake up at the time that you were supposed to go and do the thing that you said you were going to do. Okay, well, why is that? Maybe there's a bit of a deeper surface layer mental in going on and a blockage. Okay, let's explore that. I tell you what, I'll be outside your house tomorrow at five o'clock. I'm going to do that for the next two weeks. And guess what? I've done that with a number of my athletes meet up with a couple of athletes every single, just because it holds them to account because it makes them do the work. And if that's the meet, if that's the middle point I need to go to, to help people to get to that stage, then that's what I'll do. And I'll sacrifice that. Guess what that comes with? It comes at the expense of me not doing those couple of check-ins in the morning or doing feedback, which then comes at the expense of me not maybe seeing my wife of an evening on a Friday or Saturday. Like if you want to be successful, you need to get out of this seven day working week bullshit. Like, business doesn't stop on a Sunday. Mm. Like people don't like, you know, the world just doesn't stop on a Sunday and go ah, rest day. No, what? Like it's the same with business. People, people, people feel like they have, and you do to a degree, you have the right and the privilege to take these days off and do that. You can do that. If that's how you want to run your life, that's fine. If you want your three or four day working week, go get it, go after it, go and do what you need to do. Expectation being is that, well, Sally and John have just found out that they're now fucking bankrupt. And Sally and John have just found out that they can't afford coaching anymore. So Sally and John have decided that they're going to stop working with me, for example. No, that's not going to happen. Sally, John, I'm going to coach you for free. Even better, I'm going to come around your house and we're going to figure this out together and we're going to work through this and we're going to do that thing. Do you know why? Because life isn't about fucking balance. It doesn't exist sacrifice i'll sacrifice the next three months of my life to make sure that you guys are back on the ground again and running because you're built on morals and ethics and selflessness mm. and being loyal to people but i'll be honest simon i've gone off a bit of rant there i'll be honest but it's there are a lot of people playing the victim card and potentially and do you know why i can say that because i did that i did that for for a number of years i played the victim card and thought to myself why am i not and I looked at other coaches and was like, why am I not in their shoes? Like, why am I not getting a result like they're getting? Like, I'm, I'm better than they are. I know I'm better. I'm delivering a better product. Why? Because I didn't do the work to build the systems that I needed to get those people across the line. I didn't mm. do the work building the knowledge base from other coaches and thought I knew better. I didn't do the work to outbound and reach the, all these people. I didn't do the work. So what did I do? I printed off flyers. I walked around my fucking neighborhood and I started trying to do the work and mm. lo and behold, the business built and it kept going. So it's, you know, what? it's an interesting analogy is that nobody will ever know what doing a paper round feels like ever again, <laughs> because why? Because the paper can be delivered on your smartphone or it can be delivered 
with the perfect prime delivery for the next day. Right, nobody's going to know what our, our paper round feels like anymore, do they? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. And it, it's you have to earn the right to do the work. I remember when I started at, at UP, I, I still lived in Wombin and just outside Wolverhampton. I went to London every day. I had two and a half hours commute every day, six days a week, right? And then I was doing all my stuff on a Sunday. And while I would never do that again now, that's mental. Yeah, but it, it, I, I. I I worry now when you see the amount of coaches that come into the industry, especially now with the boom of online, where they're looking at this as an easy option. When I wanted to move online, I, I was like, it wasn't I want to work with, on with on the beach with this imaginary Wi-Fi connection that apparently beaches have in the online training world. Yeah. It was I want to still work very, very hard. I just want to be able to do it from a coffee shop if I want to. You yeah. know, I want a bit of flexibility of how I do that work. I don't want to give up time with my family and my wife, my, you know, my friends, because I'll just get up at four and start the work earlier. It's never about not doing the work for me. And we see this now where I see coaching. I've generally seen this in mentorship, um, thankfully not on Supercharge. I think Ollie creates a, a, an environment of integrity. But I've seen, hey, I'm looking at someone uh, to hire someone to do all my programming. Uh, or and my meal plans. Who can who can I um, outsource this to? I mean, that is literally your job. Like, you, like it's like going a plumber going. Ah, I need to outsource my plumbing. And, like, and I get it. If you're a multi million pound business and you've got to be the businessman, that's different. But if you're looking to go, yeah, I just don't want to do the one thing I'm employed to do. I'm like, how comfortable have you gotten yeah. that you are not doing the one thing you should be doing? I, just, I basically want to be an Instagram influencer. Yeah. I'm like, well. You're not Logan Paul. So stop trying to be fucking Logan Paul and actually be a coach. Because if you were Logan Paul, you wouldn't have started a coaching business because you'd already have the followers. You'd be interesting enough to do it from day one. You're clearly not. Do your fucking job. And I think this is me going on a rant here. But like that, uh, like, I don't know what I think of that. You've all got the same hours in a day thing. I just did uh, my last week's episode of the podcast is me and Rob talking about genetics. Yeah. I looked at genetics, not on the lens of, um, thyroid and limb length i looked at genetics in terms of like upbringing if i grew up in the countryside on a farm where i had to cook my own food and hunt it and things like this and i played seventeen thousand sports as a kid i'm gonna have a much easier time staying lean than the person who grew up in the middle of london with low income bracket living off delivery and got an n64 on the third birthday so i don't think we have the same 24 hours in a day and i do have an element of empathy in saying that look we don't have the same 24 hours in a day. Agreed. we have a different background however the world isn't fair. And regardless whether he has a different 24 hours to you, what are you going to do about it? The like, line in that is that genetics, genetics predispose you, but they don't predetermine. Yes. Like, genetics predispose you to a particular life, a particular environment, a set of character traits, a set of um, belief <laughs> systems, but they don't predetermine what the future looks like. Because like, that's just not the case. Otherwise, how have these incredible people that have come from nothing be able to create something? Because they agreed that their genetics didn't predispose them and they, they predetermined what their future was going to be. But equally, going back to that point that you said about coaches, for want of a better word here, is that I, I think it's brilliant that there's loads of coaches coming into the industry. It's good. There's loads of, because these new online coaches have got so much to offer. They've got some technical wizardry, some skill sets that are amazing. But guess what? You still need to do the work. You still got to earn a right to do it. You know, you still have to go through, I think you still need to go through the trenches and I don't want this to be a negative thing at all. I want it to be positive. I like really, I encourage people to really think about the positivity here. Just the message being in, in that is that if you have to go out and do the heart, you've got to do the paper round. You've got to do the paper round, mate. And if you haven't done the paper round, then you, and this is interesting actually. And you can speak to Ollie about this. I work inside Supercharged Fit Pro as a support mechanism for other coaches and I run the elevation team. Now, and this is this is just how I've been predisposed and brought up to things. Like, I will never call myself, and this is really, I will never call myself a business mentor because in my opinion, I haven't earned the stripes to be a business mentor yet. I, I just don't, I just, I haven't personally earned the stripes to be a business mentor. I am first and foremost a husband, a father. That's the most important thing. I'm a strength and conditioning coach for the military. That's an important thing. I own a business and it's a successful business as an online strength and conditioning coach and performance coach. Like I help, I help aspiring high performers become high performers. I am, I'm not a business coach. However, 
what I do try and say to people, as I, I'm, and, and they, again, this is just coming back because I want to do the hard yards in business, develop the business acumen. Yeah, I might have helped people hit five figure months. I might have helped people build an incredible business. It doesn't make me a business mentor. I just call people and say to people, like, I'm, I'm just like, I'm like the coach's coach. I just help them, support them and guide them through the systems. Whereas Ollie's done that. He's done the hard yards. He's built multiple, multiple six-figure businesses, has incredible business acumen, business knowledge. He is in the absolute space to do that as a business mentor. I'm just a coach that helps through the elevation side, support people. I'm just a support staff in the back room. Hmm. And maybe that's a little bit, maybe that's a little bit of the imposter thing, but it comes back to the thing. Do you know why, Simon? Because I haven't done the paper round as a businessman well, exactly. to tell people that I'm a business mentor, which is why you, you, you won't see me post on my, on my Instagram and my Facebook and stuff like that. You won't see me share the wins of all of the people in elevation, the, the 20 odd coaches I'm looking at. I'm not going to share that stuff because that's not the messaging that I want to do in my small, small social media corner of the world. My, people come to me because they want coaching. They want to, they want to understand the, and navigate the landscape, landscape of health and fitness. People don't come to me because they want to be a business mentor. You go to Ollie because you want to be mentored in business. And then Ollie's like, I know who exactly who's going to fit the bill for you. Dean. Yeah. And Dean coaches and supports you using the mentorship learning that Ollie's has provided. You the know, t- the title doesn't make the man, right? And it is no, it's like, it's like when I was given, and I can imagine it's very same as the military, right? You can be given sergeant, commander, whatever. I, I don't, I'm not up to date with these things at all, but yeah. you given this title, and I, I am very sure that it, this, I, from the people I've met in the military, especially the guys that are on supercharge group, integrity is a huge oh. value. And, and that doesn't come because I respect you because you're commander. I respect you because you walk the walk that this position gives you. Yeah. In the same way that when I was given the mentor title in, in when I worked for a you know, big global PT company, like, I wasn't a mentor at that stage. I was just a PT. I learned that. I call myself a mentor, not for business, in the same way, because I've not earned my stripes, but a, business, yeah. but a mentor for coaches, because I've done it for eight, nine years. I've helped people get results. I've helped people through those challenges. And I've seen it in Mentorships for and business mentors that I've had. There are people at the top of the group that are business, like, that are the business, like the olives of the, of the mentorship. Mm-hmm. But then you get handed to this person below, and it's like, well, you're running a script. You, you, you've got a successful business. You do six, seven, eight, nine, ten k months. But just having a successful business doesn't mean you can mentor a successful business. Just because you can get results doesn't mean you can mentor another coach to get good results. Yeah. They are, they are. One is a prerequisite to the other, but they're not like for like skill sets. No, they're not. Any stretch of the imagination. No, you're absolutely right, Simon. I think this is interesting as well because, it, again, it comes back and, and lends itself to the, the world of coaching. So why are we so worried about the title of a personal trainer? If you are an online personal trainer, own the fuck out of that and be the best online personal trainer that you can be. Okay. This is the big thing. Like coaching is not a protected term, but people worry that they have to call themselves a coach and they might not have anything from things like, Let's and let's go down this. They haven't been through Institute Leadership and Management. They haven't got the Chartered Management Institution qualification or profession. They haven't been down that career leadership management pathway. They don't actually have coaching qualifications. It's a personal training qualifications. And you can own, like, don't be worried about who you are. And it, it comes back to integrity. Like, be integral. Be integral. And that's what the military guys are really good at. Like, their integrity just reign supreme with all of them. Like if they're a personal trainer, they're going to be a, a really, they're going to do the best that they can do to be a personal trainer. They're going to try their real fucking hardest to be a personal trainer. If you're somebody who's a, you know, a strength coach because you've done powerlifting level one, powerlifting level two, level three, you've done British weightlifting level <clears> one. <throat> yeah. You're, you're a strength coach. Own the title of being a strength coach. You don't have to become something that you're not right. And it's the same in the board of business. I'm not going to call myself a business mentor. I'm not. Ollie's a business mentor. What I do is I help coaches navigate through all of this training, all of this support and give them a clear roadmap, clear plan of action. I'm like their accountability buddy. I'm their battle buddy. I just show them the way to do it. Ollie's the business mentor. But, and that's, that, that comes back to that point, right? You've got, integrity is such a, such a lost art 
on social media because people people want it to be something and glamorize something that they're not and it, it, it you know be be proud of being a personal trainer and a coach like be proud of those things you know you don't have to you don't have to be something you're not you know hmm. I'll, um, this is an interesting question. I'll, 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 I'll almost, before I go on to my closed question, I'll leave you this one. I will have to do a part two because we didn't actually touch on the communication side of stuff that we planned to. Yeah. But I love the tangent. This has been great. Do you, on that topic, do you think that true personal trainers are in a bit of a dip? And I, I'll, I'll clarify what I mean by this. Is that now we see more and more coaches almost being glorified life coaches. It's rare that I look at personal trainers now and they're talking about food prep and lifestyles and ice baths and Wim Hof and morning routines and diary management. And it's been a very long time outside of the education space where I've seen a personal trainer talk about training, periodization, people that came before them, strength coaches, modalities, wave loading, cluster sets, drop sets. And I almost wonder, like, is personal training almost that they, as it, in the traditional sense of dying breed. I find it rare these days where if you wanted to be a professional footballer, you wouldn't go, I don't know who Messi is or Ronaldo is or Ray Mooney is. But yet we have a lot of personal trainers. If you say Charles Pollockin, Vince yeah. Gironda, Dorian Yates, uh, Mike Mensa, and people just like look at you. And I'm like, like how do you they, not know what they all did? They all, they all, you go to your Mike Boyles, you go to your Dan Johns, you go down these routes. All of these people were the best at personal training that they could be why because they spoke about exercise execution they spoke about linear non-linear undulating weekly daily undulating periodization they spoke about rest and recovery micro cycles they spoke about that to the depth and detail that excited the shit out of them and you'll get the same from the likes of me because i guess what i'm a coach and i yeah. can help you with some of the behavior change and psychology stuff because i've gone and done some of the stages of change stuff with dr gary mendoza and you you look at all that psychology but you do that work and allows you to become and help people with those psychology pieces but if you're a personal trainer like own the space be a charismatic fucker and show people how to do a back squat show people what you can look at be unique be different like dan john was Everybody used to laugh at Dan John for throwing and swinging kettlebells around, yet the bloke is still 75 and he's still doing it. People used to laugh at how Mike Boyle utilized weightlifting and Olympic lifting modalities of training to improve his athletes. And guess what? He's still doing it and getting success with it. Using sleds to the degree. Every like These people are so good. If you are a personal trainer, you want to be a personal trainer. You want to be an online personal trainer. Be the best at that. Do that. Yeah. Do that. Stop looking for a VA that's going to handle all of that. Stop look like do the hard work. Do the paper round. I I uh I think like when you, when you sort of look at this as well, I think people coaches are spreading themselves too thin because mm. they they know to get a result they need to understand nutrition, they need to understand psychology, they need to understand communication. And while those things that's true, and and we had a whole I've got a whole bunch of questions for you for a round two talking about communication because you are good at it. However. I feel that coaches now are spreading themselves so thin, they forget that to actually be a good personal trainer. And sometimes it's like, well, you look at like Tom Hibbert, Step and Gazolt, they're two great examples. Yeah. They don't do nutrition. No. Because they're really fucking good strength coaches. Yeah. And like, and that's like, while I think, yes, if you want to be a results producing trainer, you've got to get your clients to DM it. You've got to manage the nutrition. Yes. But if you, I think if, if I have to get slightly less results, but also at, do my job description. Yeah. I will do my job description over this. If I want to go down that route so far down that I have to forget about training, change my bio and put life coach <laughs> and make personal trainer the protected term. And that's not to slate life coaching. No. If you want to be a life coach, be the best fucking life coach. If you want to be a personal trainer, have an understanding of periodization and how to actually progressively overload someone rather than just say calories in versus calories out, progressive overload. Well, congratulations, num nuts. Your clients already knew that. What how yeah, are what they do actually you doing these things? Go to the lay go go layer, 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 layer deep. And again, it comes back to that point. Like, stay in your lane. Stay mm. in your lane. Stay in your lane. Do the paper round. Don't be shy of the work. Because it's exactly mm. that, buddy. Love so it. I've got one closing question I ask before I let people go. Yes. Yeah. Same one at everyone, and I always do it impromptu because it does stump people, but for good reason. Because I want real yeah. answers. Tell me something that you have changed your mind on. Ooh. 
That's and whilst you're thinking of one, I ask, I always ask this because I think we get locked up as a coaches of think, looking at people as put them on the pedestal of this person's great, this person's great. I've imposted them because they're amazing. I'll never get there. But when I speak to these people on the show and I'm like, well, let's, what have you changed? What were you wrong about? What, what have you now misguided? And realizing none of us are perfect. No. And let's just show up. So what have you changed your mind on? Oh, right. That's a really hard question. Um, fitness related or just in general, anything? Whatever springs to mind first. Oh my goodness me. Um, okay. This might be a bit out there, actually. <laughs> That's a real... You know, <laughs> it's hard when you think about it. I've changed my mind on lots of things. <laughs> lots of things. From things about cold water immersion all the way down to the application of olympic weightlifting in training programs all the way through to periodization models and using certain exercises like i used to believe that certain exercises you shouldn't do and they all everything has their place right to the right person it's got context i think the most profound one for me and this is more recent is the taboo around mental health um, for me personally, and this is only because I've been on my own journey with it and not because I'm a mental health bloody expert. Am I hell? Not at all. Um, I can only talk about my experiences. So mental health for me, I used to see as weak. I used to see, and I, I'll be honest with you, like, let's be fucking real. I used to view people that used to say things and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about military here. I'm talking about the civilian world. I used to believe that civilians didn't have the right to have a mental health issue or say things like they had post-traumatic stress disorder because I was so linked into watching people who really suffered with this, with PTSD from a war environment. And when you see people that have been through that and you work with people that have been through that, it completely changes your life, how they view things, how they see things, their energy, their their environment, their, their own self-belief, their self-efficacy, their motivation, their, everything changes within somebody that has PTSD. But for me, for a long time, I used to view mental health as a taboo subject. I used to think it was weak. I used to think if somebody said they had PTSD or somebody said they had a mental health issue, I would be like, what? There's nothing wrong with you. Get a grip. Come on. Let's." And I'm talking about military guys here as well and civilians. Like, fucking sort yourself out. Come on. Let's go. Stop. Just stop chatting shit. And for me personally, that that changed probably in 2015, 2016, when I really started to dive deep into mindset, started to dive deep into psychology, really getting into it um, and how it affected people. I, because, again, I, I used to view myself as weak when I went and seen a CPN um, after after operational tour, like, I just thought I was weak. I'd never tell people about it because I think people would think I was really weak and I was a bit fucking wet behind the ears. But what's a CPN? CPN is a it's um like a therapist, <laughs> therapist post in the in the military. But I haven't seen one of those on a couple of occasions. Used to think oh, I'm not going to tell anybody about it. I don't want anybody to know because mm -hmm. it will be weak and I don't want people to see me in that light. But it's been up and it wasn't up until 2015 16 where, again, out of the back of a really shit situation you begin to realize that everybody suffers with it in their own special way. And it's such a unique thing that we have to tread carefully. We have to be mindful of what people are dealing with. Anybody can have PTSD. I only believed it was military. Anybody can have ambient anxiety, chronic stress, chronic fatigue. Anybody can suffer with depression, whether it be acute or longitudinal, like, Everybody can suffer these things. It's not just people in the military. And that actually came because I was indoctrinated and institutionalized through the military. Mm. I so suppose some of these things, it's like it, it, they are relative, right? Because <laughs> it's relative to your experience. Because what, could, what I might find taking my stride might floor you and vice versa. There'll be things that stress you out that won't stress yeah. me out. And yeah. there'll be a lot of things that stress me the fuck out that won't stress you out. And if you're somebody who has had that comfy life and that nice upbringing in the delivery room in the N64 you might get a PTSD or anxiety or chronic stress from something that's nowhere near really, than, yeah. than the military experience. Yeah. But the military experience, they've gone through a lot more, but they could have probably handled a lot more. They've just reached that level. Yeah, you're right, mate. You're really right. And I think I just, again, I just changed. That's probably been the one thing I've changed my mind mm -hmm. on massively is 
how mental health affects and mental and people psychology, how much that affects their performance. And it's been, it's been such a massive dive, a massive dive working with Gary and going through a number of things there years ago. You just start to realize people have people, people have so many different unique qualities. And for me, as a, somebody in the military, uh, it was show up, do what needs to be done. Make sure you're dressed, make sure your boots are polished, your kits ironed, yeah. your kits pressed, good to go. Stop fucking complaining, get it done. And that's kind of been, a, it's, it has been a huge evolution. And that's been an evolution that's been only curated because of the coaching space I've been into. Because if mm. I was only locked into the military, I'll only ever know the military. But mm. when you start working out in the civilian world, and I remember, I remember my first ever Word document as a program I sent with some shitty Excel numbers on the side of it. I remember sending that to a client and thinking, oh, in fact, I remember posting, um, I remember posting paper copy workout programs and everything else every month and then getting them to post them back to me. I remember yeah, doing that. Posting stamp, stamps were so, so, it would cost me a fortune back now. Like, look at it now. <laughs> stamps would be crazy. I remember sending them off to clients and getting them sent yeah. back. But we, I, like, all the way back then, I couldn't give a shit. Could not give a shit about what was going on up here. I just wanted you to do the sets, do the reps, do the, eat the food. Done. And it's not until you start evolving as a coach, you realize that the psychology of performance and the psychology of health and the psychology of well-being, it influences people in loads of different ways. And you need to be armed with how to deal with that situation. And if you're not armed, you need to know who to refer to and who to have in your network that can help you with that. But for me, because I never explored it, I thought it was taboo. I never touched it. And it's not until you dive really, really deep and you get into the psychology of sport, you can psychology of performance and really start understanding habit-based, chain-based, behavior-based interventions with people that you realize it's it's not taboo. It's mm. It needs to be normalized. It needs to be spoken about because the more we speak about it, the more that men particularly view mental health, not as a taboo or as a, as a, as a, as a stigmatizing subject. Because for me, that's how I viewed it. And I want to spread the message that if you're not fucking okay, it's okay not to be a fucking K. If you're in a shit place, it's okay to be in a shit place. But what are we going to do about it? Yeah. What are we going to do about it? How can we help you? What can we do? Who can we refer to? Who can we speak to? What support mechanisms can we get? And again, we might, it'll be ebbs and flows, peaks and troughs. And eventually we'll come out of that trough and the peak will just continue to climb so that your base layer trough is never back down in the dirty trenches. It's middle tier. Because you can deal with things and you've got the tool sets, you've got the mechanisms, you've got everything that you need to support yourself from a mindset perspective. That's why communication is such a powerful tool. It's why I'm so passionate about communicating with, with people. Why I'm so passionate mm. about helping people improve their communication. Because if you, can, if you can become a better listener and a better doer, you then improve that individual's results thousands of times over because you're not just armed with sets and reps. You're armed with thought processes. You're armed with tools which can then be vocalized and you can use that to the best of your advantage and your ability to get that result for that client. Whereas for a long I, time. I, I love that. And I, I also feel like there it's, it's almost important that you went to one extreme to be able to find back and find that middle ground. Because I reckon a lot of people would talk about without going into it, because it to be a three hour show, you know, we'll, <laughs> people, people, people will people find that middle ground. If you hadn't gone to that, I don't give a fuck, just do it mentality. You would find maybe almost be too empathetic and be the yeah. renter friend. And it's finding that going so far to find that balance the other way will give you a perspective. Like giving you going into the military gave you a perspective that no one else could have. Yeah. But having that opinion now coming back gives you a perspective that someone that maybe was a bit molly as a kid will not have. And they may be a bit too genuine. And I think we've basically said here that we've, we've got to have this part too because we've, we've gone into it. But for, for in the meantime, until we arrange that part two, if people want to find you and mm. learn a little bit about this from your own profiles and social medias and wherever they can get hold of you, where can people get hold of Dean? So you'll find me on any, most, if not all social media platforms um, as either Dean Hammond or Coach Dean Hammond. Um, you'll see me on there. If you want to, again, you'll find all my email links across Instagram, Facebook. They're, they're all over. There's, I have got a huge digital footprint um, <laughs> because I've, not as in I've got loads of followers and stuff like people that randomly shout about me as in I've just got a digital footprint because I've spread myself everywhere. So <laughs> like a virus. Um, and again, like, yeah, if you want to, I'm not even going to say no bullshit advice because it 
depends it's contextual based on the individual but if you want to come along and be part of that social media corner um you want some extroverted entertaining kind of unapologetic advice unapologetic support um and just a good place to be i like to try and think i bring that to the social media sphere um if not you're welcome to listen to this podcast and, and never drop a drop a reach or a follow ever again. It's entirely up to you at the end of the day. The, the bottom line is I, I just I'm out here in the world trying to make a difference, trying to make it a better place. Whether I do that with coaches, athletes, clients, people in the military, um, people follow me because hopefully I just make them feel a little bit better. And that's the goal. Right. Awesome, man. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure. And if people have gotten this far in the show and are still listening, I'm assuming they're probably going to give them a follow. So go and give them a follow. <laughs> and if you are at this stage, as always, like, share with somebody else, subscribe to the channel, especially on YouTube. The more we can get this podcast out, the bigger the guests get, the bigger, the better the conversations have, the more I can devote to this. So Dean, thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. Catch you soon. You're so welcome. And thank you.